This is a breakdown of farms in the US by size and income. You can see that for all but the largest farms, growing food actually loses money. Almost all farms in the United States supplement their income with non-farm activities. These other charts show the number of farms has decreased in the last century, while at the same time farms got bigger and bigger. Today, agriculture employs less of the workforce than at any time in our history, and farms are ever more expensive to operate. All of this is proof of something Karl Marx predicted about capitalism over 150 years ago. Karl Marx was a historian by trade. Economics wasn't really a field of study in Europe at the time. His interest in economics was to understand this new mode of production called capitalism that had never existed before in history. Marx's study of capitalism was incredibly thorough. He was actually the first economist to have had a PhD, and applied his methods of studying history to the study of modern capitalist society. Europe, unlike other parts of the world, did not have a rich history of economic study. Adam Smith was one of the first Europeans to argue that there was such a thing called an economy. This combined with capitalism being an entirely new economic system meant that many people disagreed about what the nature of capitalism was. Marx made many observations and predictions about capitalism, which at the time got laughs. He said recessions were natural things to capitalism, not special circumstances. Capitalism was cyclical in nature, even if there was a general upward trend. Many disregarded this prediction as nonsense and proof that his underlying theory was wrong. But 150 years later, the idea that capitalist economies will have booms and busts and regular recessions and depressions is seen as an obvious fact. To this day, the only economies not to have had regular cycles of boom and bust were the centrally planned ones, very different from the market capitalism elsewhere. Marx also predicted that capitalism would tend toward monopoly. When the Communist Manifesto was written, the norm was not gigantic all-encompassing firms, but many smaller ones. He predicted that as capitalism matured, these firms would conglomerate into gigantic enterprises. Another prediction which he was laughed at for. But now, this prediction has been proven so correct that it's almost impossible to imagine that anyone could really have thought capitalism's forces would keep businesses small and numerous. These predictions ought to have made Marx famous, but like most of Marx's work, it's ignored and suppressed and lambasted for being political. Few today know that many of his predictions, which were made from observations and theories over 150 years ago, were incredibly accurate. Another key prediction Marx made was that over time, the rate of profit in industries would tend to fall. Perhaps nowhere is this clearer than the U.S. agricultural sector. Today, agriculture is going far beyond nature. Wherever you look, more useful, more efficient machinery. When something is made specifically to be sold, it's called a commodity. The value of a commodity, that is the price that it sells for, is equal to the value of the raw materials that went into making it, the wage paid to the worker who made it, and the profit that goes to the capitalist. Because the value of raw materials can also be broken down into these three parts, the value of commodities is roughly proportional to the average amount of labor it took to make them across an entire industry. If a bunch of farms all take 100 labor hours to make a bushel of wheat, then a bushel of wheat will sell for about 100 labor hours worth of money. If some firms are less efficient and take more labor hours to make a bushel of wheat, they then have to charge a higher price or make less profit. They won't be able to compete and will eventually go out of business. If one farm makes a labor-saving improvement, it can undersell the other farms. Competition makes every firm either adopt this new labor-saving device or go bankrupt. Thus, the proportion between price and labor content remains roughly the same. Labor-saving devices, often called technological improvements or capital improvements, reduce the value of the commodities that they're used to make. Prices fall as automation increases. Think about books. It used to be very labor-intensive to make even a single book, but the printing press automated it. Books went from being very valuable to being incredibly cheap. This also happened to milk. The dairy industry has gotten more automated and machine-intensive over time. This line shows the price of raw milk, but this other line adjusts it for inflation. The real price of milk has fallen over the past half-century. The number of farms declined, the size of farms grew, the portion of labor going to agriculture flattened, output of milk rose, but prices stayed the same or collapsed. Larger farms were more able to buy new equipment, and so smaller farms either went under or were bought out. 
This was also true for wheat, for corn, for barley, soybeans, eggs, cotton, chickens, melon, alfalfa, hay, tomatoes, cows, basically every agricultural product. Farming as a whole has become ever more productive while employing less people. This is the heart of Mark's prediction that, in the long run, the rate of profit will tend to fall. As automation increases and labor goes down, profits will also go down. When Marx uses the word profit, he means something slightly different than the common use of the term. Marx broke the value of a commodity down into living labor and dead labor. Living labor is the labor currently being put in to make the commodity, hammering, sculpting, operating machinery, whatever it is. The dead labor is the labor that was already put in to make the machines and raw materials that are being used by the worker to make the new commodity. It was living when it made those commodities, but now it's dead. If a bushel of wheat is ground to make flour, then the living labor that went into harvesting the wheat will become dead labor. Marx splits living labor into the wages that are paid to the worker and surplus value paid to the capitalist. Dead labor is split into the labor that's in the raw materials, seeds, water, fertilizer, and then whatever amount of wear and tear happens to the machinery, tractors, harvesters. If a million dollar tractor can be used to make a million tons of corn before it breaks, then the amount of value it adds to each ton of corn is just one dollar. Going back to books, the amount of labor that it takes to make a printing press is way less than the amount of labor it would take to write the million pages that it could print by hand. That's why the printing press was an innovation. It saved labor. With these values, Marx described two ratios, or rates, the rate of surplus value and the rate of profit. The rate of surplus value is the ratio between surplus value and wages. It's the ratio between how much of the new value being added by living labor is going to the capitalist and how much of it is going to the worker. If we add in the dead labor to the bottom of this ratio, we get the rate of profit. This is how much value the capitalist gets as a share of all the value that they don't. Some of the value in the wheat was embodied in the water and the fertilizer, some was in the tractor, some was paid to the farmhands, and the rest went to the capitalist. But why did Marx say that this rate would tend to fall? Look at the equation and remember the farming industry. If technology advances, or more of the production of a commodity is automated using machines, the amount of value added by living labor will fall. There's less value being created by living labor to extract surplus from. This is definitely true of the agricultural sector, as more and more heavy machinery is needed to stay competitive. Although, that's only true if wages stay the same. Increased wages will force down the rate of profit even more. Capitalism is a zero-sum game after all. To combat this, farmers and agribusiness, like all industries in the United States, take advantage of there not being strong union representation. Without collective bargaining of farmhands, domestic workers and temporary workers are pitted against each other, and the transitory laborers can be exploited more since the cost of living in their home country is so much lower. When there was a mass exodus of industry from the United States over to cheaper Asian markets, this is what was happening. The rate of profit in those industries was falling because of how automated and capital intensive they were becoming, so they moved to a place where they could extract more surplus value by paying lower wages. If raw material costs go up, this will also drive down the rate of profit. Modern agriculture requires nitrogen fertilizer, phosphorus fertilizer, fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, inputs which were largely unneeded, especially in the amounts they are now, or were replaced with living labor in the past. Seeds themselves have also gotten more expensive as GMO conglomerates dominate the market. This also doesn't even consider the costs not paid directly by the farm, such as the environmental costs of soil depletion and fertilizer use, the cost of water depletion in aquifers, and pollution from agriculture byproducts. If these costs were paid by the farmers themselves, many would go out of business. The relationship of the falling rate of profit is a little harder to see in other industries, because there are many tricks that the capitalists can use to guarantee that their profit rates are maintained or even go up. We talked about a few of them. But in agriculture, it's quite hard to hide these. You can't just pick up land and move it somewhere else. The falling rate of profit causes immense problems for the agricultural industry, and thus for its products and us the consumers. When food is produced, it's a commodity. It's only made to be sold, not to be eaten. This leads to many perverse incentives. At the start of the COVID pandemic, countless tons of food were left to rot on fields. Thousands of gallons of milk were dumped down the sewer. 
Because farms have to operate for profit, and because COVID destroyed the ability of the public to purchase the commodities, farmers cut their costs. It would cost them way more money to harvest the lettuce and spinach and to store the milk in large vats than it would be to let it wilt on the field or to dump it down the sewer. Food isn't produced for use, but for profit, and until that changes, all of these problems are going to continue. Something produced to be sold instead of produced to fulfill a human need is called a commodity. Food needs to be decommodified. We know how to produce more than enough food to feed ourselves. Why do we let 38 million people, including 12 million children, go hungry each year? That's 12% of America. Yet 40% of what we grow is thrown out, never eaten. The perverse incentives created by capitalism are to blame for this, and nothing else. In this country, the most favored beneath the bending skies, we have vast areas of the richest and most fertile soil, material resources in inexhaustible abundance, the most marvelous productive machinery on earth, and millions of eager workers ready to apply their labor to that machinery to produce in abundance for every man, woman, and child. If there are still vast numbers of our people who are the victims of poverty and whose lives are an unceasing struggle all the way from youth to old age until at last death comes to their rescue and lulls these hapless victims to dreamless sleep, it is not the fault of the Almighty. It cannot be charged to nature, but it is due entirely to the outgrown social system in which we live that ought to be abolished, not only in the interest of the toiling masses, but in the higher interest of all humanity. Insulating food production from capitalism by decommodifying it would protect the public from food price increases and shortages, farmers from risk and debt, farmhands from wage competition, and our natural resources from depletion. As an example, rice production in Vietnam is partially decommodified. The government acts as an intermediary, setting prices paid to farmers to guarantee a livelihood, setting a separate price to consumers to guarantee cheap staple foodstuffs, and also controlling exports to prevent shortage and waste. Many US farmers deal with something similar. Independent dairy farmers deal with Land O'Lakes, who buys milk from them and then sells it to milk product manufacturers. To regulate this, the state of Pennsylvania set up a milk board, a state-level government body which regulates the prices of milk and milk products. They set the price that Land O'Lakes pays to the farmers, the price the grocery store pays to Land O'Lakes, and the price that you pay to the grocery store. Not just for milk, but many milk products. Capitalist competition in farming is incredibly detrimental for all of the reasons that we just went over. The vast majority of rice farms in Vietnam are small, family-sized enterprises, and many of them choose to work cooperatively with each other. Price shocks for rice, as well as many other staple necessities such as pork and even gasoline, that face large shocks and shortages in other countries, face much smaller shocks, if any, at the same time in Vietnam. The milk board, though, unlike Vietnam, is not a single buyer and seller of milk. It's not a full decommodification of milk, because milk is still produced and distributed to be sold, rather than to be used. There are still giant firms and independent farms operating under the cutthroat nature of capitalism, its profit incentive, and all the other horrors that come along with it. But it's a major step in the right direction. If a system like Vietnam's was adopted, the government could buy milk from farmers at a price to guarantee their livelihoods, and then sell it to the public to protect the cost of living. Unsold milk could be exported for a profit, and the money could be used to supplement time when milk production falls short. Even a more complete decommodification isn't impossible or even difficult. There are already standards for milk products, so quality could be maintained in exactly the same way it is now. Instead of having the farmers sell their product, they could all be employed directly by the state and have quotas, just like how employees in private companies are paid a set salary and have quotas for the work that they do. Now, many out there will say that the government can't be trusted to grow food. It's too important, and the government is inefficient. One big criticism of government enterprises is that they duplicate efforts, meaning that they waste resources doing the same thing twice or three times. It is true, every organization duplicates efforts, including the government. But government duplication is nothing compared to free market duplication. The entire goal of free market competition, after all, is to duplicate efforts. The goal would be for many companies to make many identical or similar products so that the consumer could choose which one is best, and then all the other ones that aren't good enough just get wasted. And the companies themselves are also duplications. Instead of having just one large factory with incredible returns to scale making all of the products that a country needs, we have a ton of them. Think about all the extra machines that are made, all the extra small buildings, all the extra middle management positions and accountants, all the extra research and development that had to be repeated because of trade secrets and proprietary information, all of the advertising, the legal battles. 
Cars are probably the worst example of this. Instead of society paying the cost of having a few well-built and comfortable and frequent public transportation services, we all now have to buy our own wheels and tires and seats and doors and windows and insurance packages for our highly engineered pieces of plastic and steel that will sit around for 23 hours of the day going completely unused. Cell phones and electronics are made to break after two years. All the extra programming that's done to make sure that you can't get free copies of books and movies. Don't talk to me about how governments duplicate efforts. Duplicating efforts is private enterprises bread and butter. Every time there's an economic slump through no personal fault of their own, millions of farms in the United States risk going under, millions of people risk losing their jobs, and thus millions more risk going hungry. Milk could be distributed to grocery stores and everyone could be entitled to a single portion each week. The cost could be paid by an annual tax. This shouldn't sound too exotic since this is exactly how education was decommodified. Public schools are the decommodification of education. The same goes for the Postal Service, a decommodification of delivery. Decommodifying things is incredibly efficient. Think about if public parks were re-commodified. Giant fences would be erected so that no one steals access to the park. Maybe a guard or two would be employed. You'd pay someone to sit at a ticket booth all day, or you would hire some company to make an online payment subscription software and get some heavy-duty app reader and pay kiosks installed. Now, just to use the park, people need to wait in line at the single entrance or buy a cell phone with internet access to pay for not only the upkeep of the park, but the cost of the guards and the ticket booth and the ticket checker and the profit of some shareholders all on top of that. Instead of just now, where you have a small amount of money, just what's required to maintain the park, taken out of your paycheck automatically and you never having to think about it. Think about all of the administration staff that exist in commodity production of food that only work there to make sure that profits get paid. All the middlemen and extra steps. Not to mention profits themselves being a waste of money. Profits to mega farm shareholders and agribusiness distributors could be returned to the farmers as bonus pay, or to customers as discounts, or put in the general state budget to fund other public services. We would be an actual land of plenty, not a fake one where almost half of our plenty gets thrown in the trash while 12% of us go hungry. To truly see the efficiency that decommodification could offer, look no further than the United States Postal Service. The US Postal Service is one of the most efficient operations in the world at what it does, specifically because it's decommodified. Using the same number of employees and with less annual revenue to work with, the US Postal Service delivers over one and a half times as many packages as FedEx or UPS. And on top of that, they also deliver 150 billion other pieces of mail each year that aren't packages. In fact, the US Postal Service delivers half of all the mail in the world. They deliver almost 500 million total pieces of mail, letters, packages, folders, postcards, etc., each day. One billion hours ago, modern humans first start to emerge on Earth. A billion minutes ago, the New Testament is written down. A billion seconds ago, the Berlin Wall came down. A billion pieces of mail ago at the US Postal Service is yesterday morning. All of this at zero cost to the taxpayer. They deliver to every address in the United States, which FedEx and UPS surely don't do. In fact, when FedEx or UPS, or even Amazon, think that they can't make enough profit delivering a package, they offload the cost onto the US Postal Service and have them deliver it instead. The USPS charge the same rate to mail a letter from Honolulu to Detroit as they do from Baltimore to DC. It's like something out of Kropotkin's Conquest of Bread. To deliver something, the US Postal Service spends about $2.21 on average. It costs UPS $18 and FedEx nearly $28. To deliver 1 million pieces of mail of any sort, the US Postal Service would need 3 people, UPS would need 102, and FedEx 183. If all this efficiency can be gained in a service like delivering packages, just think of what we could have if food were to be decommodified along the same lines. Think about all the gains that could be made if the entire food and agricultural industry switched its primary goal from being to make as much money as possible to be delivering the best and most product as possible. We hear the propaganda that private enterprise and the free market and capitalism are so efficient, but in reality, they're awful at what they do. 